it's always like different people's names that's in the credits of any show you're working on. So as a music supervisor and a music coordinator, the music coordinator is the person that actually finds a song and the music supervisor is the person that places the songs. What's going down? It's the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast. We've been throwing a lot of surprises at you lately. Big surprise now is we have another special guest. I don't, I don't know how we still manage to bring people on here, but I guess they don't know who we are and they just unwittingly agree to appear. So shout out, shout out to the latest victim of the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast, Bari. Um, good, good morning, everyone. How, how's everyone feeling? uh i think i've had a rough week pain i know you 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 we were talking before uh yeah. we started filming about your rough week Aaron, aaron's doing amazing but barry how are you <laughs> Bar barry how are you doing man <laughs> i'm doing amazing too <laughs> nice sure. nice yeah it's a good week it's a good week for sure just to give people a little backstory on how me and barry met this was just last year when i was still working for beat stars he was one of the artists that i had reached out to to potentially do some work with um that i was excited to work with so that's how we 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 built a connection um and then obviously i left beat stars and i still reached out to barry I, we're gonna work on something at some point actually in the very near future he's actually scoring um our web series so we were the episodes still aren't finished yet bar that's why you haven't heard from me but no, they're tough. coming to you soon so the big jaws upcoming uh cuddle season web series he's going to be scoring uh but when we spoke one of the times we spoke um he told me about a story and how he got into scoring so bar i just want to want you to quickly introduce yourself because i i made a tweet recently i said it's not always how many people or how many views you get but who sees your stuff? So continue yeah. to put out content because, you know, you just never know who's watching. So just a brief intro about yourself and then, you know, kind of tell us that story on how you got into to scoring for, for television shows. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Bari, songwriter, producer, composer, artist. I do a little bit of everything. Um, just moved from Jersey to L.A. this year. Um and I'm, let me just tell that story. So, yeah, I, I basically was just dropping music just like any other artist. And I was getting maybe 10 to 15 streams, maybe 200 or something like that, something like. But then I got an email from a guy named Kurt Farquhar. He's like one of the top legendary composers. He did Moesha. He did the Parkers, Proud Family, just all of any black show of the 90s, Sinbad, all of those shows. And he heard it. He was like, man, this this is dope. I want you to come to L.A. and let me just see what you got. So I came out to L.A. He didn't know I was the producer as well. So I started playing him a bunch of stuff. And then from that time, he just kept telling me to come back to L.A. So I kept coming back to L.A. working on him, working on him. And eventually, he, I cold scored the um, the score for uh, Real Husbands of Hollywood. Did that with him. And then from there, we started doing The Proud Family and sacrifice in the game and all these different shows from there but it really was that song that had 15 streams on it that everybody's you know everybody was like man that song is good but nobody's hearing it you might as well take it down i would have took that song down i would have never had that opportunity so that's why when you wrote when you wrote that tweet that was very important for people to see because it doesn't matter how many streams you have it does matter like who sees it so that one person is changing my complete life just off of those 15 streams I got. So mm -hmm. that 16 stream that he gave me, that's changed my entire life. Do, do you know how he heard it? Do you know how he became one of the 15? I think it's just Spotify. I think he just went on Spotify and was just like listening. I think he also was getting recommendations from other people and just sending it. I guess he just heard it. I really, I never, really never got the backstory behind it, but I know it, it was random. Oh, that's right. super, that's super dope. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that's just a great. I mean, I've heard a lot of examples like that. And obviously it's not a force. Again, just going back, it's very hard to make it in this industry. So it's not a for oh, yeah. sure thing. Nothing's for sure. But, you know, if you feel strong about something and you feel like, you know, that this song is great to you, just keep putting it out and just keep getting better, keep getting better because yeah. you just never know, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. Who, who's then even it? even after that um that song was only getting 15 whatever streams the next song after that got a million streams next song after that got a million streams so i started progressing after that by continuing to put out music but like i was saying people were telling me to take that joint down it's only getting 
15, 20 streams, you might as well take it down. If I would have did that, it would have, it would have messed up everything. So I think that but, consistency and just dropping, like you said, is, is important. Wait, so what happened in the middle? You went from 15, 16 streams to a yeah. million streams? Like, what's I, don't, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I really, I really can't tell you. I think, I think we had this conversation before. It's like some of the songs I have will do whatever, 100,000. Some of them will do a million. I don't know. I can't, I haven't figured that part out yet. But I know that the consistency of dropping music, you'll start creating that fan base and eventually it will stick. So I can't even tell you how it's happening, but I've been getting a lot of support from the DSPs and it's just, it's, I guess the consistency is just working out. So, so, so going forward this year, like how do you plan to split your time between your own artistry, you as an artist, and, and now getting all these jobs scoring television shows? How do you plan to... Yeah, that's that's the dilemma right now. I'm trying to figure that balance out because with scoring, it takes majority of my week. Um, so I, I really have to just figure that out of, of uh, how to balance that. So I haven't yet. I don't have the answer to that yet. I'm still trying to figure that out. For sure. Yeah, so I, I got. Uh, sorry, to cut you. yeah, I, I got two questions though, as a producer myself. Yeah. Um, first, how did you learn to score? Because scoring is obviously different from producing a song how did you yeah. learn that skill set and then secondly what does that process look like when you're actually in the studio with uh the whole you know production team yeah so it's it's um it's weird because with scoring for like television and film is different so television is different from uh doing films or movies so like with tv is really about the dialogue like and music, like, you know, we're making a record, like, you can put any sound you want, vocals, whatever you want, but with scoring for TV is really about the dialogue. That's the main thing. So we always have to make sounds that would not step on the dialogue, pretty much. Um, so once I learned that, it was the same thing as making a track. You just have to pay attention to the screen and pay attention to what's going on and facial expressions and things like that. So that's what he's, he's teaching me right now. He's teaching me those things about uh, really what works with picture and really what doesn't. So that's the process I'm in right now. Is just I'm in a learning curve of just really being able to do it fully, completely. Um, but it is a learning curve. Like once you get into it, it's just music. Typically, it's just the same thing that we're doing with records. You just have to carve around it and kind of do the transitions with uh, picture. What, what would you say is something that surprised you about learning that process or something that challenged you? I thought that you could just put a beat down and go through the whole scene and that's it. I thought it was done after that. <laughs> I did that the first couple of sessions I came to the studio and he completely, he was like, throw all that fucking shit out. He was like, every, every note of music, delete that shit because it wasn't doing anything. It was just sitting there. So once I learned that you have to move, like it could be little things, like somebody could be arguing and one person could smile and that changes the whole music. Now you got to shift. So like more of a light kind of kind of thing. So once I learned that, that's when I was like, okay. So if I pay attention to the shifts and the mood of the scene, then I can I can score anything. So it's really about knowing what's going on on the screen and paying attention to that. And after that, you should be good. When he reached out initially, did you know who he was? Because I think a lot a lot of people might have got this email and be like, this is awesome bullshit. Just because everybody's skeptical, you know, when you get an email like that saying oh, yeah. hey you should come to la did you already know who he was or did you have to do your research i, I did i did because i i don't know like with scoring i always wanted to get into scoring for tv like that was that was my goal i didn't know how to do it i didn't know how i was gonna get into it but i knew that he did the proud family that was one of my favorite shows so when he reached out i was skeptical for sure i'm like yeah this this can't be him it has got to be somebody else but then he gave me his number and was like give me a call so mm -hmm. i called him and i was like oh shit this is really him and then I came to L.A. I probably had like literally one hundred and fifty dollars to get a flight. Caught that spirit joint. Came out here. <laughs> came out here in the studio. I had my laptop and it was over. over man, bro. It really was. So I like you said, I definitely was skeptical. I was like, it, it can't be him. Why would he call me? They took the spirit flight from coast to coast. Spirit, that's, that's spirit flight is nasty. Don't I don't <laughs> recommend it. <for> <laughs> that's a nasty um, flight. 
Man, that's dope. Well, I'm looking forward to to working with you on this on this cuddle season project and then beyond. Hopefully we can yeah. get you. Tried to get him on the soundtrack. We won't go down that that story, but uh hopefully now let's go down the story. That's, 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 <laughs> no, I, I that's can't, I, actually that's a good story. So we I'm not gonna give the specifics on on this show, uh, but it was obviously we still have a, a real positive relationship yeah. and we plan on continuing to work, um, hang out, everything. But you know, I presented him the terms of like how we plan to work with our artists on this soundtrack it wasn't something that he wanted to partake in and it was just like okay it's just one of those situations like i always say in, in, in previous podcasts like hey we should be able to come to the table you should you should understand what you want i should understand what i want and if we can't have a meeting of the minds everything's still all love like it's cool we just weren't able to work that situation out and and that's what it was because for this particular project um you know we have we have we're not taking any of the publishing but we're doing splits on the masters because for this project we're kind of acting as the label right like we're mm -hmm. we're getting we're putting out money to get the songs mixed and mastered like we're we're shooting videos uh there's going to be a heavy heavy marketing push behind it so we're kind of acting as the, the label um and feel free body to 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 weigh in from your side on kind of how you see things yeah. because you have like a big part of your catalog or how you make money is sync, right? Mm -hmm. So just exactly. maybe share your perspective on how you view the opportunity. Yeah, no, I thought it was I thought it was a great opportunity first. Like I don't want to shit on the opportunity at all. But like within the last year, I I've probably had 40 placement, 40 sync placements. Mm. So every song to me is like is my baby, you know, it can make, it can make money. It's all diamonds to me. So for me, when someone says like, we want part of the master, that's automatically me taking half or whatever the portion you want from whatever I would get from the sink. And also being able to move with it, move around with it. Cause I'll also have to get permission. This is all different things I think about as far as like moving on with like sinks. Cause sinks is a quick thing. If the, sh if the show says they want something on Monday, they're going to have it on TV by Friday. So I don't have time to like really be able to say, oh, damn, is it okay if we do this? So I just always think about it in that way. If we were in, in the studio actually creating it together, it's the master is something I, I would never give. I would give more of the publishing than I would the mastering for me personally, um, okay. because that's where that's my bread and butter. That's where I make most of my, my income. So I have to have to be cautious with giving anything with my master's. That's why it's crazy that all these guys are selling their masters. I think that's just crazy to me too. Just, just alone. You're talking about the catalog. You're right? talking about like the catalog sales. Yeah, you're talking about so all of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is very, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, two different things. Sorry. I was, yeah, mm -hmm. just watching like Justin Bieber and these guys sell sell their portion of the catalog is just crazy to me because right now you, you they're looking for money, but down the line someone was, may sample their song or whatever it is. Sync may may get a big sync and a big movie and now you sold your portion that you can never make income on again mm. so these are just things i think about i'm not talking about the cutter season specifically but just those are the things i think about from a business standpoint and, and that's fair like i heard him he heard me and you know i think i told him like hey just just watch how we put out this one yeah and if you think it makes sense for the next one you know we're going to be shooting the lesbian homie three right after this which i will well, I hope cuddle season is just as big as the lesbian homie, but the lesbian homie already has like a fan base and momentum. So just, it will probably be a bigger series just because it's three and cuddle season is just a new series. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so just, just to, to be transparent, like what the, what, what we were doing was on the publishing side, we're not taking anything, you know, it's, it's, it's producers and, and, and the writers of the song. So it's 50, 50, we're not touching any of the publishing. What we were asking for is just 20% of the master. So we kind of served as kind of like a distribution company, uh, or, or the label essentially. So that's what we, that's what we are asking for, for the people that are participating in the soundtrack, um, and we think that, and that's similar to how we did one week notice. If I might be exactly how we did one week notice um, before. So, you know, and I'm open to refining it. Like if, if there's something that, that goes wrong or right, like we can, we can always like, you know, negotiate going forward just to make sure everybody's comfortable and happy. Cause I just didn't want, I was quick to say like, Hey, let's just wait for the next one because like, I'm not going back and forth with people like mm -hmm. I'm not trying to 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 move people off their mark. If that's how they feel, 
you know, that that's, that's what it is. I want to respect that. So, you know, we'll revisit that conversation on the next project, you know, if there's any interest. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And also, also one thing about sync that a lot of artists don't know is that your vocals is something that could be completely separate for TV. Like uh, we get this thing called SAG. So SAG fee is they pay for your vocals. So anytime I have a song that's on TV, I get sync fees. I get a SAG fee. I get, all those royalties every single time too. So that's a completely different thing than just the music itself. So I don't, I don't think a, a lot of artists don't know about that. And I made a lot of money off that too, just having, you know, my vocals on stuff as well. How, how did you build up your presence in the sync world? Cause a lot of people want to get a big check for a, a, a song. And, and I know that there's a lot of people selling courses and, and blowing smoke on, on IG about like how yeah. you start landing these, these placements. How did you start, um, getting so many I realized that it's not about the music it's about the scene so if, if they're doing a scene and someone's arguing and I send a, a pop pop dance song they're never going to use it so once I started studying the shows and looking at what they use typically I just started making songs that sounded similar to what they already was using so all these shows basically have a sound they all they all have the same sound they're all using the same type of songs so if you make those and gear it to that, then you'll get you'll get sync places all the time. And don't do things on the production side that's going to mess with the dialogue. So these are just two things that probably people don't know at all. But how did you get those relationships, though? Like, who did you send it to? Like, who did you meet that, that started? Oh, yes. OK. So I kept coming back and forth to L.A. Um, off those stairs flights. And I started meeting music supervisors because I realized if you're looking at credits, it's always like different people's names that's in the credits of any show you're working on. So as a music supervisor and a music coordinator, the music coordinator is the person that actually finds a song and the music supervisor is the person that places the songs. So once I met both of those individuals, I just started sending them to as many music supervisors and consultants as possible just to get in there. So once that started landing and I started understanding what they were looking for, I just continued to keep feeding them. And then now I'm just, I'm locked in. Mm. I'm locked in all these shows. And you were you were were you making songs just to send them, or you were making so, or these were just songs yeah. that were you as an artist, and they just happened to fit the shows. No, I started doing that. Like once I realized the formula, I just started making songs specifically for these shows mm. because I was like, okay, there's it's no point for me to even be worrying about my artist stuff because I can make these songs; they could get placed here, and then I could still release it myself. So mm. I just started going in for like two or three months to making only stuff for sync. I wasn't even worried about doing artist stuff at all, just to lock those in. And 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 that's what was so like when I when I started to hear your story, I understood why you had the perspective about your songs. So that's why yeah. I was really like, okay, you know, it's, it's it's all good. You know, we'll, we'll circle back. Um, you know, but but yeah, man, that, that's super dope. Um, any more questions about Barry's story, or are we gonna tee up a few more few more topics? Well, I have a topic that relates to his story. Okay. But Aaron, you if you want to jump in, that's cool too. Uh, I have my pull up. I'm not I was just it. gonna say Dame said that you were gonna be on and he thought I was gonna like your music. So I am in the process of a writing camp right now. Um I'm yeah. helping to run one. And so at like one AM I was like, Okay, cool, let me check it out. And I love your music. So <laughs> I appreciate that. That's what like, I thought you was gonna say it's trash. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I'm really into R and B and a lot of people that I listen to are like in the hundred and fifty thousand or less, you know. And I just think that R&B is so rich right now. It's like 90% of what I listen to. And like your song, Do You Write? I like played that on repeat until I fell asleep. It's so yeah, like, sure. it's so captivating. So I don't really have much to add to this, except for I became a fan last night. So shout out Thank to you. you. I get it. No, I definitely I want to tap that. in and ask you more questions offline. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I definitely think I definitely need to, to put a good percentage of your time. I know you're winning in the in the scoring in the sync world, but a good percentage of your time should be on you yeah. as an artist this year because I yeah. think there's, there's a lot of potential there for sure. I know I've been I've been getting beat up by that on um, IG the other day. I posted like new music, just new music question mark, and it was like a thousand people that hit me up and was like, "Yeah, where is the new music?" And I was like, "Damn, y'all actually care." I actually know people gave a fuck, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely going hard. My my next single is coming out on um, February 24th, so 
Dope. I'm gonna definitely be dropping every couple of weeks now. Dope, dope. Because the sync world is just like you said is is they need it now, and it'll be a crazy yeah. ass. So it'll be like hey, by two this afternoon, yeah, you need a full song. Here are the reference points. Here's what the 100%. description of the show is, and you're like, yeah, damn, this is you know once you get into that world, if you don't keep up the pace, you're not gonna make any money. So you fall off. Yeah, I was trying to explain that to a lot of people. Like, bro, like literally, they'll send me something monday and say we need it by wednesday 3 p.m and they need three different versions of that same shit like especially for like a disney channel show like they might ask you for a 30 second version a minute version a version without the core like you got to do all these different alterations so for me i'd rather do that and make xyz than to spend time on the artist stuff and potentially it goes goes up or potentially it doesn't so that's where my focus is at right now. But it goes in seasons, though. Like, these shows, each show has a production season, and then they have the season where they release the show. So I do have, like, a downtime coming up where you can be able to focus on just the artist stuff. But, uh, yeah, I, I recommend every every producer, every songwriter, every singer to try to figure out how to get into sync and just mm -hmm. keep making music for that because it's important. And also, let, 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 let me correct myself in case I just realized I made a mistake. So that the percentage, because on, on the cuddle season, I was like, that didn't sound right. On the cuddle season project, it's actually 30%. So it started at, at 40 and then we lowered it to 30%. So 30% is what we're asking for, for the, for these songs, um, for what we're investing into it. And, you know, Jaws platform has already proven to have a very positive impact on songs with other artists that we worked with. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, before somebody from the Cuddle Season Project hits hits me and sees this podcast, but it wasn't twenty; <laughs> it's actually thirty. I, I pulled up the contract right here. I was like, "Yeah, I'm tripping." But anyway. Barry's point in regard to to okay, so you're you're saying all right, well, we will sync your song to Cuddle Season. Um, we're just gonna take thirty percent of the mastery. You keep seventy percent, and you keep. Well, we all split with the producer. Books. No, the producer the producer gets twenty percent. The, the producer gets 20. But uh, in Bari's case, he's he's the producer and the artist. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So for him, you know, he's getting the he's still getting the majority, but that 30% yeah. of the master means he can't move on the it sounded to me like you were saying earlier, you might want to use that record that you created for Cuddle Season in another potential sync. Or at least right. have it in your catalog and if they have some of the master then because the way that syncs work i believe correct me if i'm wrong it's like the the person who places that sync they'll assume the role of the the publisher correct. Um, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis so correct. you could take if if dame just took half of your publishing on that particular track but none of the master you could say all right I'm still going to be able to use this song somewhere else and not have to consult Dame because now we're starting from zero on the publishing and I control the master, which means he doesn't yeah. have the ability to to stop this or to hold it up yeah. by not responding. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, but that's only from my situation. I want to make sure that's clear too, because with me, I have so much access to the music supervisors that I can divvy it up wherever. These other artists, I think, is a great opportunity. Like, if you don't have that, it's a great opportunity to get into that world. So I want to also, like, I'm not trying to bash Dame, but it's it's a great opportunity for other artists to do that. But right. like I said, for me... But I also, this is also where we kind of get hurt by just kind of, like, how the stories of, like, shadiness of because why would i ever hold up like why like, why would i ever yeah. hold up a place like i would never do that like that would be stupid of me to do if there's more you know money on the table well, or you never know what could happen like and it's not you yeah. know you, you you fuck around and do that and one shit and you hurt yourself again and you can't respond to an email in time or something and then like obviously right. i don't wish that on you but it, it happened recently you weren't totally out of the game you just hurt your back or something but um i think it's just because that world is like so fast paced if 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 they're offering you the deal at at 7 a.m if you don't respond by by noon they're going to give it to someone else it's like you need 
you can't have right. another person even be an hour or two later than, than you. You got to be on. I'll, I'll give you a prime example. I'm sorry, Dan. I'll I, no, good. Prime example. Prime example. I had opportunity to do a major theme song for a show on CBS, right? Four years ago. That show is now like one of the biggest shows on like TV, period. And I didn't respond back to it. I couldn't get to LA. I think I couldn't get to LA or something like that. And now that show is worth millions of dollars. That one that one theme song is worth millions of dollars. Just because I missed I missed the day. I couldn't come to LA the next day or something like that. So Damn. that is it's that serious. And that could have been completely life changing just by having that. So to me, I always take these songs as like it's really is really that serious. Like it could really happen tomorrow to where somebody can want something and I can't get in contact or you just don't agree with the term. You might not agree with the terms that they're saying, but I have to consult with you or whoever because you're part of the master owner. So just things I think about like that, man. It just and also like right. you said, things that happened in the past, I'll probably bring it up now in, in, in this situation. I get I mean, what you're that, saying too. No, that that I mean unfortunately that's how it is. And you gotta protect yourself. You know, we yeah. only met last year, so it's not like, oh you know, Dan, you know how responsive he is. He, you know, he, yeah. so it's it's all good. But again, that's why the conversation was so healthy to have, because then I, I understood, you know, I understood yeah. why you, you have that perspective. Um, but, Pan, you were about to you were about to get into something else. Um, well, for the record, I, Dame, I would give you 30 percent. But um, so what I'm going to talk about is AI. It's a follow up from last episode. Because what I'm hearing a lot, and I just want to get your perspective on it, Bari. What I'm hearing a lot is, well, one, we, we, the episode hasn't even dropped. And the premise of the episode is me hearing a lot of recording artists shitting on producers by saying, well, you're going to get replaced by AI anyway. So that's why I'm not paying for your beat. So, you know, whatever. It's just like more animosity created within, you know, the, the DIY artist community. Um, before the episode even drops, I haven't even edited it yet. I get this response on uh, Facebook by a rapper who, after all of this talk, concedes that he only has 53 SoundCloud followers and isn't actually taking music seriously yet. So his first line is, all y'all producers about to be replaced by AI. I honestly think BeatStars ruined producers' expectations. 500 for an exclusive that the artist needs to drop. Another 500 to record Mix Master. 100 on a cover photo. Potentially thousands on a video. And now after spending all this time, we have to pray for promo. Um, blah, blah, blah. BeatStars ruined the game. The age of demanding producers is shifting and the age of AI production is beginning. If you want to stay ahead, jump on that bandwagon early. So basically, producers asking for $500 for their work is the reason they're going to be replaced by AI. Um, you're a producer and an artist, so I think it's an interesting perspective. But I also want to know, because what I'm hearing from people with a more sophisticated analysis of AI is that the sync world because it's so fast paced and because the sound is so specific and simple, honestly, yeah. um, compared to, you know, what you can get away with in a, in a, in a song mm -hmm. that that's just meant for, for listeners. Um, what I'm hearing them say is, okay, st that world music supervisors, they're, they're going to love the AI generated production. And in fact, it's already starting to replace actual humans. I, I don't personally see that. I don't, you know, people swear up and down. That's what's happening. They, they don't give examples because, you know, confidentiality, but I threw a lot at you. Let me just shut up. I, I'm curious. Yeah. To hear your no, I, no, that's one. I, I got to say the AI would be impossible to replace because it's so many things that people want to shift, like the shift points that you have to make on TV. AI can't generate that. They, I don't know if they could generate full moods, I don't, if they can do that, then we'll get replaced. If they can make full mood shifts of like, if somebody does the slightest thing with their eyebrows and changes the whole scene to be comedic, if they can do that, they can replace us for sure. And But I don't think that's that's possible. And then going back to the, the SoundCloud thing and like people saying $500 for a beat, my, you know, my electric bill for the amount of beats that I make to get you that one beat might be that. 
or whatever the equipment I buy might be 10 times that. Like my microphone is 10 times that. So you ask me asking 500 for a beat is like crazy, bro. Like I don't understand. Like if you're not able to do at least 500, you shouldn't be doing this at all. We spend hours on, on this music. We spend hours perfecting beats and mixing it and searching for new sounds and all these different things. And I don't think people really realize that part. They just want to jump on a beat, rap, and then put it out. So at least we could get 500 if you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to generate any money off it. At least we could get it 500 for a beat, no? So what is your, like, when you're when you're working with an artist on the production side, like, what are the, some of the variables going into, like, how you guys sort out that agreement? Yeah, so the also as a producer, I think a beat maker and a producer is two different things, too. So beat maker is just person that makes beats and then somebody raps on it. But if I'm actually I'm actually creating a song with you, we're actually molding it together, structuring it together. That's a producer. So you need to pay that guy more, you know, more than you would pay somebody that's just a beat maker is randomly doing beats. That's one. And then um, also when I'm in the studio, it depends on the artist I'm working with. One, if it's somebody that we built, we built a relationship where we built the sound. It's a little more lenient with the cost than a person that I don't know at all that's coming in that wants to work with me. So yeah, it's, I guess it's case by case basis. But uh, yeah, you got to get something for your music. I mean, you're, you're taking time, it's time is money. So at least a little something for the beats that you're making. Are, are you even interested? Like what, in, in terms of your level of interest, obviously, you know, you're having a lot of success scoring your own artistry and then producing for other artists. I would imagine that that's probably third of the like one, two and three. Like. Yeah, no, I still work with other artists. Like, I'm, I'm working with Tone Stith right now on his project. Like, I still work with other artists, but I'm very selective. Like, I, I'm I'm in the place now where I can be selective with who I, who I work with. But before, I was trying to work with anybody. I didn't care who it was. Mm-hmm. They were dope. I'm just trying to lock in. Like, let's figure it out. Because I think that's how, if you, if you look at it, like, the artists, the producers that work with new artists and blow up, that's the guy that usually stays with them. Like, 40, Drake, Main and Pre, Usher, like that. That's really what you want to make. You want to build up a new artist in the first place, because I think that's probably how people get on it anyway right now. Right. All right. I'm going to I'm going to totally switch topics. I know there was something that came out this week where TikTok, uh, somebody revealed that TikTok has like a heat button. Like so behind the scenes, there's employees at TikTok that can kind of push the button um you know there's always been this this mythical button um hobson used to talk about it when i when, when i worked with him a funk volume like we need somebody to push the button and <laughs> i used to try to tell him like it's not like that but i guess on tiktok it's kind of like that there's a button that 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 people can push um maybe not a, a physical button but there's there's ways to to get some content trending and i think all platforms have this you know, I don't think this is this is like specific to TikTok. I think people at Facebook can can circulate things more widely, Instagram, any platform. Uh, but just what we're I'm assuming that all of you guys saw at least a tweet about this. Um, what were your initial thoughts when you, when you saw this? This is standard practice and everybody's yeah. going to lose their shit because I'm saying this, but it's like. It's true. I remember when I was a young manager and I got to the point where distributors were reaching out to me for my artists and they were like, hey, we can connect you with YouTube. We can do this. We can do this. And I was like, wait, (laughs) you're telling me that you'll make my life easier just for us to keep distributing on your platform. And then, you know, like when you go do office visits, like I'll be in L.A. twice in the next several weeks and we're doing office visits. We're going to Apple, we're going to Spotify. The reason that you do that is so that they get a preview of the music. And then that means that usually they'll circulate to more playlists. People will say, see, that's why the industry is cap, gatekeepers, 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 but it's how it works. If music is a commodity or relationships are a commodity, the more valuable you have a relationship, the more valuable your commodity, the more the relationship will enrich you. You know what I'm saying? Like if I have something to offer that they want, i.e. 
an independent artist who's streaming really well, it helps their platform for us to continue to work with them, to offer them exclusives, to let them sponsor our events. So this is standard practice. This is how the world works. So for anybody who's surprised, everybody's like, we knew it, we knew it. I'm surprised it came out. I'm just going to say that. I'm surprised to the specificity that it came out. But yeah, like, If you get an account manager with any of these platforms, this is literally what they do. They'll be like, hey, let us know what you have coming. We'll circulate. We'll do internal marketing and we'll see what happens. They don't guarantee you a certain number of spins, but they will make guarantees. They can put you on the charts. They can put you in a certain amount of playlists. Like this is a standard practice. So if you are an artist who's frustrated that you're not getting these type of looks or opportunities, all you have to do is grow your awareness and grow the desirability of what you have to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes I get these offers just because platforms want to work with me. They don't care how big my artist is. They're like, Hey, you have anything coming from anybody? Well, we can fast track you to here. Triller used to do that. I don't know if Triller is still even a thing, but Triller is like, we'll guarantee you a chart spot for 10 days and we'll make sure that at least t- 10 Triller influencers will redo the song, whatever, whatever. It's how they keep their platforms relevant. If the biggest creators feel like they're getting incentivized to be there, they'll stay. If not, they'll go to whoever will incentivize them. So this is how business works y'all it's not even just the music industry this is how athletes work why do you think your favorite athletes go to these shoe companies why do you think your favorite athletes go to certain strip clubs like it's the incentivization if you do it right then you'll start to maneuver in the industry that you want and get the things that you want but this is how the world works that's why likability is such a major thing that's why uh awareness is such a major thing if you understand the way that things work you'll win yeah, 100% agree. What if you could? That's how, that's just how yeah. business works. When you, that's yeah. literally how business works. So I don't, I don't know why people are like shocked by it. This is literally how business right. is structured everywhere, like in any in industry. I so, think yeah. people wanted a reason to be like, we knew they were lying, but it's like, it's not a lie when this is how it works. Do you know what I'm saying? If I had nothing to offer, if I just came on my first interview and I was just like everybody else, Dane, you would have never asked me to join the MEC. But because you recognize that I had value to offer the community, you were like, hey, let's make an equitable exchange. If you're interested in this, I would love to put you on this platform and you can now be a part of the Beat Stars contract that we used to have. Now, whatever type of stuff, like you let me be a part of this. It benefits me because it grows my platform. It benefits this platform because I'm bringing a different perspective and a different fan base. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I think that people don't understand like collective bargaining or um like beneficial relationships. So they're just like, yeah, we knew it's not or- all organic. There's nothing in this world that's all organic, especially like even farming. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like there's shit they put in the food to make it grow. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's how the world works. You have to organically have something. There's got to be a seed there. But yes, there are button pushers who can make shit go. But that doesn't make everything happen. I know a ton of button pushers. I still have to work every single day. And I have to show up and be excellent. And so do my artists. I think it just like, you know, for the artists like Hobson that, that, that just talked about this mysterious button, I think it they felt like they were proven right that there was a button that somebody pushes and then like just amazing things happen when in reality, it's just what you described. It's just like, Hey, you have something of value. People want to work with you. So it's just, it's just a relationship based thing. People support you. If you fit within what they're trying to do and more things start to happen. So it's not necessarily like just, you know, somebody behind the scenes, like pushing a button and it's not the Illuminati or anything like that. Uh, but I think the way that the article was pitched, they felt like relieved that they were right, that there was a there's a button, there's a button that somebody pushes and then that leads to immediate success. Well, to um, me, it's like the Illuminati conspiracy theorists where it's like the Illuminati is at the heart of everything evil going on in the world. They control finances. They control this. They control all these systems. And you're like, wait a minute. We know who controls these systems. 
it's not the Illuminati. We can name the organizations because it's out in the public. You just aren't paying attention to those sources because the, the conspiracy is way sexier. Same thing with these um, platforms. We know who YouTube music is run by. It's a label person. We know about this is this is publicized in major magazines. People just don't care because they'd rather learn about what who their favorite celebrities having sex with. But when when you see an article that says, you know, UMG Inc. deal with Spotify and you just gloss over it, what do you think that means? That means Universal Music Group and all of the, the labels under them have a direct tie with Spotify, some kind of mutually beneficial relationship. So no wonder their artists are doing better. No wonder they're getting the majority of the royalties. No wonder they're on all these playlists, even the ones that are supposed to be, you know, for new artists. No fucking wonder. And so when a conspiracy comes out about a button pusher, I don't I don't like that they call it a button because we know the button's just a metaphor, right? It could be an email. You know that's that right. was like the spiciest headline. It's heating when they push this button. I'm right. like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, and then it's because people think it's going to be like you know every every Illuminati label exec has this little red button hidden somewhere on their desk that they can just you know an artist comes in they're like yeah I like this person they 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 uh, they they drank the goat blood and they sacrificed a family member here. <laughs> reach under the desk and hit that button and then bam, you know, they got a trending TikTok dance. If, if it was really just as simple as like pressing a button, then how come labels have such a high failure rate? Like so many. Say, like I know people signed to <laughs> every single major, Rock Nation or well, Sony, UMG, all of them that are not doing anything like broke yeah. and upset. It's like it can't be. And then speaking of Spotify inking a deal with UMG, now Lucian Grange is now being like the the splits on Spotify aren't equitable. And I'm like, no shit, Sherlock, you are the one who helped set these like what? But yeah. So even when you're coming in as the big person, there's still people who are struggling to get what they want. You know, it's it's just a consistent, it's a whole free market and we all have to go in and get what we need. But it's like, of course, you're going to make relationships. Of course, of course, you're going to build. Of course, you have to figure stuff out. But like, yeah, the button gets pushed, but it's not changing everybody's life. But And it's frustrating because I, I imagine all four of us here have been called gatekeepers at one point in our lives, just because at some point, you know, after like 15 freaking years of working our asses off, something positive happens. And they're like, Oh, they have opportunities. Like, no bitch. I have a lot of tenacity is what I have. I have 15 years on you. That's what I have. So when something positive happens, they look at one of us and it's like, well, they didn't say my name in this interview. They didn't, they didn't retweet my music. You know, they have the power. They have they have their finger on the on the on the heated button or whatever we're calling it. And they could push it for me, but they're choosing not to. It's like if I could do that, I would not be here. Cause I would just yeah. be like in Mexico having fun. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, so would I like that, I wouldn't be working this hard. Like if it was that easy, I promise you, like I don't have the dream to work and be a mogul like most people do. Like I want to help black people. That's why I'm here. But if I could just push a button, I would push buttons for the people I like and I would be on an island somewhere legitimately. Mm -hmm. We we should talk about gatekeeping next week. Um, I'm sure there's some interesting thoughts around that. Um, but let's go ahead and wrap it up. I know Aaron has to run. Um, and, oh, and Aaron's has, gatekeeping this podcast today. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> and I'm sure Barry has cooler stuff to do. Yeah, a little bit. Nah, <laughs> I appreciate, appreciate y'all bringing me over, man. Wait a minute, Dame. Hold on, Dame. I got I got cool shit to do. I'm going to Costco after this, so um, speak for yourself. And then and then Payne, Payne is going to be taking more shirtless pics at the gym, so he's got he's got better things to do as well. So. Well, the gym is right over there, so <laughs> it's very possible. Um, there you there you go. I don't know why shirtless pics are the only ones that the algorithm on on Instagram really favors but yeah whatever I'm, I'm happy with my progress <laughs> it's because it's harder to have abs than to be a millionaire statistically so they're like oh we have to show this outlier that is that for real 
It's like you have a, what is it? I think one in every 200 adults um, have abs and it's like one in every 118 people have the opportunity to be a millionaire or something like that. Oh, I'm trying to do both. Okay. Yeah. Facts. There you go. Let's, yeah, let's do that. Um, so on that encouraging note, Bari, once again, appreciate you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the insight. Yeah. yeah, no, of course we thank you. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. I thought this was a pretty rich episode and we hope you agree. We'll be back same time, next place, same, same time, same place next time on the MEC podcast. Peace. Peace. Peace.